Hello everybody and welcome to the third episode of Social Europe Talk from the European Parliament in Brussels. My name is Henning Meyer and I'm Editor-in-Chief of Social Europe. Today we're going to talk about European democracy and I'm thrilled to be joined by four uh, brilliant panelists which I would like to introduce to you briefly. To my right is uh, Ska Keller from the German Greens, who also was the lead candidate in the last European election. Javi Lopez from the Socialists and Democrats in the European Parliament, an MEP from uh, Barcelona. Sophie Heiner from the Eckmann Institute here in Belgium. And last but not least, Uwe Optenhögel from the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung here in Brussels. So, Ska, first of all to you. Uh, if you look at the state of European democracy, and especially against the backdrop of the refugee crisis, uh, where do you think we are? What are the problems and, and how can they be addressed? Well, with regard to democracy, I think indeed we have much space to improve the European democracy. I think it's not completely, you know, on the bottom. We have actually uh, instruments at the European level that um, that ensure democracy, but we're not at all finished yet with that. And we, what I think we need to do is involve more the citizens of the European Union, the people who live inside the European Union, to take part in decisions. But I would see the refugee issue quite separate from that, because that's not so much an issue of democracy. It's an issue of missing solidarity between the member states. What we should do about refugees is quite clear and on the table. It's not rocket science. What we need to do is organize legal and safe entrance possibilities for refugees and then distribute them fairly among the member states so that every one of the 28 member states takes their responsibility. And then looking at figures of like one million more or less refugees coming on 500 million inhabitants in the European Union is not so much. The problem is one of solidarity and of uh, lacking uh, distribution. That's the problem we have here. And of course we could solve it with normal democratic instruments that we have. We're going to have a Dublin reform, like the reform of the system that kind of not distributes people right now. Um, and the parliament can make changes to that, so we could reform it. The problem then comes into play with the council, where um, member states can block reforms that are proposed by the European Parliament um, and uh, and that that even though it's a sort of a second chamber um, if we think about it that way then we need to have also different instruments of how the council would react so that it's not just a couple of countries that can simply block any reform idea. Mm -hmm. Javi, this uh, lack of solidarity isn't that also a problem for European democracy? Absolutely. Um, it's uh, very good to start uh, talking about where we are and probably uh, we are in the worst point, in the worst situation that uh, the European Union was in the last 50 years. Uh, only uh, talking about this and uh, being aware about the, the crisis we are facing, not only with the uh, refugees crisis, also with the economic and the eurozone crisis, and, and now uh, under threat the unity of the European project with the Brexit uh, referendum, we will be aware about our situation. And uh, solidarity is a main point, um, obviously, but to understand what is happening now. Uh, we saw with the euro negotiations, especially with Greece, a lack of solidarity, and now we are facing a lack of solidarity with uh, this uh, management, this disastrous management of the refugees uh, crisis. And if we think in all this crisis, we are being uh, inefficient, and this is very clear, uh, uh, and we are not building answers based in our values that uh, European uh, has. And probably this situation, this inefficient, is provoking a national withdrawal in the governments and in the citizens, that it's a, a paradox because we need more European framework to face all of these challenges. This is the paradox that we are living. We need more European framework to answer these geopolitical, uh, migration, economic challenges. Uh, but the European inefficient is provoking a national withdrawal. And this probably is the, the, one of the main points that the public debate and the parties should mm -hmm. face. Mm -hmm. Sophie, yeah. how you mentioned that this is just maybe the latest installment of a series of crises. Uh, do you see it the same way that you know European democracy has been under tro under pressure from a variety of crises over recent years? Yes, yes, exactly. And um, what I, I would just like to say, um, similarly to uh, Ska, um, that I, I don't think we should mix the issue of the refugee crisis with the question of democracy because I think they're, they're separated. But indeed, it's a, it's a crisis that actually reveals the lack of efficiency of what we have built at the European level. And I, I'm very skeptical of putting this crisis in terms of uh, a moral issue. Uh, I understand all the talk about solidarity, etc., but I don't think 
politically, and generally speaking, it works if you speak about refugee crisis as a moral issue. I think it's mainly a problem you need to solve. And it actually reveals the lack of capacity that we have both at the national and European level to solve a very, I mean, uh, in a way, a very normal problem in terms of economic crisis and uh, when, because of all the, the, the conflicts that we, have, uh, that we have outside the EU. And so I know we're going to speak about that later, but I really think what it shows this lack of ability that both national institutions and European institutions have to solve the refugee crisis, it reveals the lack of sovereignty. Um, I'm really, I'm, I'm very, um, I really don't abide by the view that sovereignty shared as it is now and divided as it is now in this framework that we have, this multi-level governance framework that we have, uh, actually works. I think when you share sovereignty, when you divide sovereignty, uh, in the end you abolish it. And what we need now is to actually rehabilitate sovereignty at some level. And obviously, I'm a federalist, so I believe that we have to do that at the European level. We probably all share that postulate that we need more European responses. But the question is, the devil is in the detail, but also in the principles and how we actually uh, build a European sovereignty in practice. Mm -hmm. I guess we'll speak about and the refugee crisis is one aspect that could be, I mean, one problem that could be solved much more efficiently if we had a genuine uh, European sovereignty. Mm -hmm. And we will come back to the to the issue of sovereignty later. But Uwe, do you agree that you know uh, the refugee crisis has nothing to do with how democracy works and also with the moral basis? Because the view from Germany is is clearly that there is a, a moral imperative mm -hmm. attached to the to the political issue of the refugee crisis. Now, in the first place, I would agree uh, to to Scar's position uh, not to mix things. I think the, the, the big problem with the refugee crisis is that it carries many dividing elements for the union as a big union of 28. Uh, but this has not all to do with democracy. Uh, so uh, I would say in the first place that um, uh, it puts into question uh, the unity of the European Union and it adds a divide to uh, one we already had over the uh, Euro crisis. We had a north-south divide and now over the refugee question we tend to have an east-west divide. But what's behind it in my position is, uh, and that touches on democracy, because it touches on values. <coughs> it looks like people like Orban and Kaczynski and also to a certain extent uh, Fizzo in Slovakia and, uh, and, the, and the Czech president, um, that they want uh, different societies and they want uh, different, a, a different Europe. And that goes to the value basis of the European Union. I mean, they all are signed the Lisbon Treaty and the Lisbon Treaty guarantees human rights, freedom, democracy, equality, rule of law and respect uh, for human rights. And that is what we see is not happening in, to a certain extent in uh, countries like Hungary and Poland. And it has to do with the refugee crisis, but the refugee crisis is not the origin for violating democratic rights. So uh, I see the point of solidarity, but uh, for me the main point is the question of values. Do we share values as we have assumed over many decades? Mm -hmm. And it seems to be that we do not share a certain set of values with some other members who go elsewhere. I mean, Scott, an interesting question. Is this sort of renationalization of politics uh, in the refugee crisis uh, an expression of what Uwe just revealed? I mean, we published an article by Lubos Blaha, who is a, a Slovak uh, mm -hmm. MP and the uh, head of the European Committee, and he basically made the point, a social democrat, and he made the point that you know, this refugee policy would lead to a multicultural society. Slovakia is not a multicultural society. We didn't have a societal debate about whether we want to be one. So we're not going to have this being forced upon us. Doesn't this, this kind of reveal a very different approach uh, to values and, and how you understand the democratic process within the European Union and also your own national role within that? Well, actually, I think it's striking how similar the debates are. I mean, I remember in Germany we had this big debate about, oh, are we an immigration country or not? Mm -hmm. This was completely outdated by the next time anyone looked at the issue. Mm -hmm. And so I really wouldn't say, for me, it's maybe not so much in, in, an issue of having fundamentally different values. That certainly goes for our governments. But do we have, as Europeans, as people who live in the European Union, shared values? And there I would say... 
Um, if we look at what happened also in Eastern Europe, uh, also in Hungary, when refugees came, they were helped. They were helped by people, normal people. Um, also, there was this study uh, or a poll uh, saying that the majority of Europeans actually wants to have a different, uh, different distribution. Um, and that, that seems to mean that the people in Europe are much further than their governments are. I mean, the governments are trying to win votes by appealing to people who don't like refugees, but I'm not sure they're actually targeting the majority here. The majority might be different. Just because you have a small, very loud group of people who rejects anyone from outside doesn't mean they're the biggest force of that all. So, so I think actually, Europeans, from what, what we could see, really do have that shared value. And of course, the question is also, is it about values or not? Mm -hmm. On the one hand, I would say yes, because if you have people dying and your borders, like do you rescue them or not, is also an issue of values. And the question of solidarity is also one, like do you share the responsibility is one of values? Because uh, on the other hand, you have loss. For example, you have to rescue people at sea. It's not a value issue, it's a law issue as well. Uh, or um, do you process their asylum claim? It's a law issue. And also no mm -hmm. one can say we don't let refugees mm -hmm. in because we're culturally <coughs> prepared. That's also a law issue. But the question of distribution, that's one of values because indeed the law says send them all back to Greece. Question is, do you do that or not? And that's one of solidarity. And there we're failing. And I agree, this issue is not just one of refugees. It started earlier. We've seen it in the in the economic crisis, uh, where how the way Greece was treated was also, I think, one of the issues that might lead us to Brexit, because mm -hmm. the progressives in the UK were looking at it and saying, oh my God, is this the European Union we're supposed to fight for? Maybe not. Uh, so it's in there. It's in the refugee issue, where again, it's linked to Greece. Um, and but it also goes for all sorts of other issues where we see that really the issues of lack of solidarity beats climate uh, crisis and all of that. Mm -hmm. So I, th I do think it's a bit mixed and just looking at the law certainly is there and we do it, but it doesn't hold the whole picture. <clears throat> yeah. Javi, the, uh, the impact of uh, sort of these governments and the countries. I mean, if you look, for instance, at Hungary, unfortunately, if you look at opinion polls, it looks like there's the right and the further right. Mm -hmm. So the pressure actually to uh, Orban comes from Jobbik. Uh, rather than from the political center. So, I mean, I just say, we should yeah. just look at the East, you know, for example, if we look at Spain, um, dear Mr. Rajoy has also not uh, been taking his share of refugees. Uh, Spain has only resettled 18 refugees of its quota of, I don't know, a yeah. couple of thousand. So it's just, you know, to mm. make sure that it's not just about the East. Yeah. And, and in it's some of the Eastern countries, quarter. obviously, the problem started before the refugee crisis came to a head. Yes. Uh, I'm, I uh, I uh, share your opinions that uh, this is something about uh, legal obligations, refugee, uh, because this is not only a values or a moral thing. Uh, the question is if we face our legal obligation as international community after Geneva Convention that we have. Uh, and this is a something about solidarity between countries. If we uh, share our responsibilities, and this is a key mm -hmm. point, to try to manage uh, the crisis. Um, but um, I will want to, to add something uh, more, is talk about uh, the Euro crisis and how this is uh, linked with uh, the refugees uh, crisis, because our problems um, doesn't, uh, didn't start yesterday. Uh, we are having um, a collapse of the confidence of, the, of a lot of citizens in the European institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, this is very clear in the South. Uh, in the southern mm -hmm. countries, uh, and we are having a, a really, really, really scary movements, uh, extreme right movements. Uh, we are seeing the polls in the uh, Netherlands, in Austria, like mm -hmm. in Germany uh, now, and this is this is the reality uh, now, and we should try to understand why this is uh, happening. And I think or equan uh, or an equality is inequality is breaking our societies. Mm -hmm. And this is a key point. Um, we have a massive divergence between the South and the, and the North. Mm -hmm. And this is not only economic or social, now it's being political divergence. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and this is a, a very important point because this will make uh, much different, uh, very di di and difficult to take decisions together. Uh, the next uh, years. Um, and uh, we had, uh, this is quite clear, we had uh, not enough tools 
to face our uh, economic situation, mm -hmm. and uh, we had um, our incorrect analysis about our economic crisis. And now we have more than 20% of unemployment in some countries, uh, and this uh, social crisis is uh, provoking a political crisis mm -hmm. in some countries. And it's affecting, obviously, the heart of Europe. I mean, in your uh, country of origin, Spain, uh, yeah. what has happened to uh, the reputation of the European Union ever since mm -hmm. the, the economic crisis? It's collapsed only here, uh, to explain more or less. We were historically a uh, very pro-European country for historical reasons, mm -hmm. after a long dictatorship. Uh, mm, Europe was the door to the democracy, to the values, to the social rights. Mm -hmm. And if we look the polls in during the crisis, uh, the confidence in the European institutions is mm, uh, minus 35, mm -hmm. less 35 points. I mean, if, if I may, I think this is a very strong point you make, because I think the European Union to, the, to its citizens has had two promises. One promise, the original one, was we have a peace union that was more for our parents, never again war in Europe. But since the accession of the southern countries, Greece, Spain and Portugal, the promise was if you join the club, you're going to be rich and beautiful. And since the euro crisis, this is no longer true. Europe has produced winners for decades and now it produces winners and losers. And the losers react. So in my interpretation, yeah, a, a, a large uh, a portion of the, uh, the, the populist right-wing vote in the East and the West yeah, comes from the losers of globalization as a subjective feeling and reaction of citizens who lose and do not win with a membership in the European mm -hmm. Union. I mean, Sophie, do you agree with that? that the broken promise of convergence and inequality issues yeah. within and between Obviously. countries make European democracy a very tricky concept. I think, I think everyone would agree with that, but just, if I, if I may, I think it, it confirms the argument according to which um, politics and the EU legitimacy in general is not based on values or moral issues, but on interest. I think yeah. politics is about interest. Sure. And I don't see why when we speak about the refugee crisis or immigration policies, suddenly we should shift to values. I think the only way of solving what is the that problem, for this? Uh, well, the thing is, we have built this uh, borderless um, space, the Schengen mm. space, without creating a common border. I mean, the, 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 propo the propositions uh, made by the Commission in that respect are uh, very good and going in the right direction, but it's not sufficient. If you abolish internal borders, you have to create an external border. And I think mm. a narrative, a political narrative that would sell that to voters would be much more efficient mm. than just talking about um, rescuing refugees at sea, whether or, or when they arrive and sharing them, whether it's based on legal rights, because I agree with you that it's not just values, it's about uh, legal rights, I mean human rights, but legal as well, enshrined in, in European treaties and, and, and international conventions. Um, but it would be much more efficient if you mix the dis discourse with something that would have to do with the interest of uh, the European citizen. And my analysis of the rise of uh, populist parties is that they're actually, well, populists from the right and the left, they actually thrive very much on this subjective feeling that our individual interest as European citizens is not... Um, uh, fulfilled anymore by the EU institutions and by the national institutions. Mm. And I think uh, the, 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 the promises made mm. by the, uh, the European project initially was very much based on that. It was a very yes. functional, instrumental project, peace and prosperity. And the value, that's a veneer, that's very interesting, that's very beautiful, etc. But that's not what drives but, politics but one quick question, uh, in the first place and in the last place. One quick question about this distinction. How would erecting an external border, or sort of fortifying an external border, serve the self-interest narrowly, first of all, and second of all, how would that sort of rectify the moral obligation no, no, I said that, that we... Common border, border management, that doesn't mean erecting a fortress. Okay. But the thing that's is, no I mean, we have already, we have an external border that's there. It's supposed to be managed by the member states and some do it better and some do it worse. And I'm explicitly not saying that Greece does it worse because, mm. I mean, you know, they yeah. have to deal, they're just doing it bad out having a fence at the land border. Um, so, but I'm not against at all, at all against having a common border management. But the question is really, how do you do that? And the commission proposal does not do anything in that regard mm. because the only thing they do is strengthen a 
a Frontex agency, which is mainly dealing with stopping refugees. Whereas what you actually have a problem with is weapon smuggling, human trafficking, and actually mm. controlling who's coming in and who not, be it refugee or who not. And that isn't touched upon at all by that. But we've been looking at it some years ago and already. But the problem is that whatever study came up with the idea that you could only have another hierarchical level at the border management, because mm. in the end, it, it's not us in Brussels who can say, OK, border section A needs strengthening, so I move a bataillon, so to say, of border guards to that section. You can only do that at local level. No, but th th that's the problem. It's because it's a European issue. I mean, you need a European response. Uh, that's, I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense that this uh, problem has to be dealt with by national authorities. And the Frontex agency is totally underfinanced. I mean, you, uh, that's the question of the budget as the well. The question is what are they supposed related to do? To the and Frontex does not do the local border management. It does not do that. It's yeah. the national. Now, you could think, yeah. you could say it should be Frontex doing that. But well, then again, it would be the people. Whether it's Frontex or another agency, no, but then again, it should be a European. But it's an, if it's an European agency, you will have someone sitting in Warsaw and Brussels saying, OK, you guy go there. And I don't think that's efficient. No. That's not feasible. So no, but I, having, having some sort of European coordination of all that. Right, but let's come we have to that. the issue. How I does disagree with that. On, the, on democracy in do Europe. Yeah? I think you got a point when you say if we would have a functioning border management, be it more or less national or EU, yeah, mm -hmm. it would serve uh, the people inside the European Union who are afraid of many people coming in. To this extent, I would accompany you. But I think the trouble we have with right-wing populism, more with right-wing populism than with left-wing populism, which is also uh, uh, coming up again, is, and this is the democracy point, for many people in the European Union, democracy has not delivered. It has not delivered wealth. It has not delivered security. Since the Russians have attacked Ukraine, inside Europe there is practically traditional war, a means of gaining land again. Mm. That was not the case since 1990. In, in, uh, in, Czech, in um, Yugoslavia, we had a civil war kind of situation of uh, uh, the, the dissolution of a mixed state before. But it was the security order, the European security order, which was always taken for granted st since 1990, uh, was put in question by the Russian behavior in Ukraine and this kind of hybrid war. So people inside the European Union don't feel secure as they felt before. The economic system in the South doesn't deliver because if you are a pensioner in Greece, yeah, and you look back over the last six years, where, tell me one reason to be in favor of the European Union. Mm. It's only shit coming from Brussels. Mm. Yeah? It is not Brussels responsible, obviously, it's the member states responsible. Mm. But Hard for the subjective and for the voting behavior of people, the EU and democracy doesn't deliver. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I would held up. I would. I would want to hold up my 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 hypothesis that to some extent what we see with the uh, populist movements is a revenge of the losers, and it is one other thing. It's the polarization between us and them. Mm -hmm. So, but how do we get out of that? Because I would agree that the social issue is super important, and we we need to start building the social promise or the social union. But that's very difficult to do. If you have discussions with that uh, yeah. about that with labor unions, they say ho ho ho, yeah. uh, because the question is how do you improve the standards for everyone without, let's say, taking back the sweets like mm, half a yeah. century or something. So mm. how do we do that? I mean, that, that's probably one of the key questions for our outlook question towards the end. But Javi, let me ask you one question that go, builds on what what Uwe said. Maybe the problem is what we call liberal democracy. If you look at Orban, who calls his <laughs> system illiberal <laughs> democracy, <laughs> and takes Putin as a role model. Um, yeah. Obviously, that's a move towards a much more authoritarian style uh, than what we have been used to. So, uh, do you see that as one of there the reasons? There is no illiberal democracy. It's uh, an oxymoron, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, but uh, but if, if you take this at face value just for the time being, do you see that this is kind of a, the, the counter reaction that Uber has, has tried to describe? Yes, and this is a risk. Uh, but I, I will want to explain something. Uh, these uh, populist extreme right uh, movements uh, are doing always the same: is use half truth to tell a lie. Because mm -hmm. if if you want that a lie works, you you need half truth. 
truth. Mm -hmm. And they are say, telling to the people, okay, um, you have less power to decide your future. Mm -hmm. You have less power to decide our common future. Um, we have um, difficulties, we have problems with our institutions, dysfunctional European institutions. Mm -hmm. They are underlining these truths. Uh, but using a simplest and stupid answer, that the national and the control borders uh, is the answer to all of these problems. But I, I will want to, to say, okay, be aware that they are um, underlining some realities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because like try to, to, mm -hmm. to reject everything is, uh, I think it's dangerous. Yeah, yeah. More dangerous than, than, okay, like they are dangerous, but they are telling something that we should listen to. And we should uh, explain to the people that sovereignty, that they are, this is a key message, key word to understand all the strong movements that we have now in Europe. It's like, uh, okay, uh, we don't have a competition between so sovereignties in a national level and European level. This is not a competition, especially in the globalization. We should have, uh, we should create institution, democratic institutions, cooperating in the national level, regional level, European mm. framework and local government. Like how to win institutions with sovereignty. Mm. This is, I think this is like the, the, the challenge to this century. Yeah. So Sophie, now we're coming to, to your favorite topic <laughs> of, of, of sovereignty, but let me frame it uh, just one second in the yeah. Brexit discussion um, uh, that is being held in the UK where I live. Uh, one of the key issues is sovereignty and the, the general idea is that you can regain full sovereignty if you just reclaim everything back from Brussels, even though the scope of action might become smaller because obviously you have much less influence uh, about the policy issues you're necessarily subjected to. But that is the argument. So sort of withdraw into the shell, regain full sovereignty for, for ever, whatever it's worth, mm -hmm. or isn't the, the much better strategy and Basically, the definition of sovereignty in the 21st century mm. that you retain in the idea with the idea of subsidiarity, mm. you retain full sovereignty for local issues and national issues where they make sense, and with the rest you share sovereignty and pool sovereignty in order to regain or gain scope of action mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. on a national, uh, on an international mm -hmm. and supranational level. Yeah, well, I know that's the traditional way of justifying the pooling and the sharing and dividing a division of sovereignty within the EU. And a lot, a lot of justifications have been written about that in the academic world, the political world, the institutional world. I disagree with that. And there are actually a lot of scholars who are becoming skeptical um, about that view. Because uh, I think nowadays we can see, and I agree with that analysis that you've just made about partly uh, part truth uh, made by the populist. And nowadays we can see the impact of the slow undermining of national sovereignties that European integration and globalization to a lesser extent um, have created. And I think this is the partial truth of the, the, the sort of right diagnosis that populists are making is that national sovereignties uh, by having, I mean, uh, di with this division and multi-level governance that we have within the EU justified by subsidiarity and things like that, and also at the global level, actually it doesn't work in practice. It used to work when only a few matters were Europeanized, but nowadays, I mean, it's almost every, um, almost every uh, part of the life of the citizens that is partly decided at the European level. And so what, what happens from a dem democratic point of view is that policies are directly or indirectly being decided at the European level, whereas politics, you know, the, the debate uh, in, and even the public uh, space is still very much national or regional in some countries. We are in Belgium. <laughs> it's very much a, Russian, a regional matter in Belgium, or politics, um, and, and, and that doesn't work anymore because you elect politicians, uh, you elect politicians at the national level, they are involved in the decision-making process, of course, which is something that they sometimes hide when they speak to uh, the national constituencies, but, uh, I mean, they are accountable to national voters. That's, that's a real issue, that's a real problem. And the European Parliament, of course, is legitimate, but doesn't have enough powers. If you, if you I mean, if, if we speak about um, the traditional view of representative democracy, I prefer that that word, representative democracy, which is a mild and moderate form mm. of democracy, mm. I don't think what we have at the European level is uh, democratic. Mm. I know it's very radical to say that, but mm. I think 
uh, what the, the sort of institutions we have at the European level is maybe sui generis, postmodern, horizontal, not hierarchical, very interesting, uh, the, the, the three actors involved in it, but it's not, it doesn't fit the, the, the criteria of representative yeah. democracy. And I think because so many matters have been Europeanized nowadays, this is becoming a real problem, not only uh, for radical people, but also for a lot of mainstream thinkers or politicians more and more. And what we're seeing in the UK is just the extreme impact of that. And of course, when it becomes strategically interesting, because politics is about interest, to, uh, uh, to pretend to rescue sovereignty at the national level in a very uh, fast and, and radical move, uh, that, that's, the, that, that's, that's the, the gesture made by some uh, Tories Eurosceptics, then, I mean, that you, you can see that happen um, a lot. And, uh, and, and I think that sort of answer uh, will be um, more and more popular. And the problem is actually facing this sort of national sovereignist discourse. We don't have anything. We don't have much. We don't have a discourse about European sovereignty that would be mm. forceful, that would be convincing, that would mm. speak to the interests of the citizens. We have a few federalist intellectuals, federalist uh, politicians within in, in the mm. European mm. Parliament, uh, in the Commission. Um, we have a few federalist organizations, but I mean, they're not, they're not really uh, well, we heard. We come back to what, what you actually mean with federalist Popular. sovereignty in, in a minute, but Uwe, I would like, like to ask you, yeah. do you agree with this characterization? Because you might argue that the council is no less uh, uh, undemocratic than the German Bundesrat, yeah, and certainly exactly. more democratic than the House of Lords it in the United Kingdom. It depends also which council you're talking about, because yeah. there's the Council of Ministers, mm -hmm. and yes, they, there you can talk about chambers and things, but then you have the heads of state summits, which are becoming more and more important. But what they do is simply, you know, supranational. That doesn't have much to do yet, sorry, for mm -hmm. with uh, European democracy. When Sorry, when, when the yeah, Americans no, are still there, because when I meant, oh, what I have a problem with, often is that, you know, people just like to complain about European democracy mm. and, and that's it. And that's a bit tiresome. But I agree with you that indeed, I mean, the European Parliament does not have enough power. We have some very interesting elements like everything is being open and live streamed and we have to hear the, the commissioners, which you rarely have in national parliaments, that mm. they get to grill uh, all the, the ministers. So we have some good stuff in there. But indeed, we need to strengthen this European uh, democracy and the European Parliament. And even when we have powers, for example, in, in trilogues, where it's us versus council ministers there, mm -hmm. um, it, we still have a structural deficit in the way how it works, in the way that we're more conciliant, that the council is, the, is so to say, a blocking force and they can block things forever and we can't. And that we have a lot of structural problems that we need to solve. Um, and we need to deal with Eurogroup issues. Mm -hmm. We need to talk mm -hmm. about how we deal with uh, our economic governments. Uh, we need to talk how do we get transparency also in the, the ministers' meeting, but also what do we do with the heads of state and government meeting all the time? I wouldn't, um, uh, in public, um, lose too much energy in the question of sovereignty. I think people are judging politics by policy output. What comes out for me from the politics that is done? Yeah? And uh, there we have a problem not only for the European Union, but we have the same problem for national governments. I mean, we have large portions of abstention in elections. A large part of the population doesn't uh, participate in the principal uh, uh, element of a democracy, an election. Yeah? And this is not only a case of a lack of democracy in Europe, but apparently this us and them we have on the national level as well. And then I would also say I would be a little bit cautious um, in creating a polarization between uh, government and a rather advanced uh, public opinion or the peoples are ahead of their governments. I mean, uh, the Polish government recently elected had a large majority in... in, in Actually, it was not so much if you look at how many people went voting and then how much did yeah, they get... This is the point I was want to get oh, to. Yeah? I mean, <laughs> in, in real terms, they are governing with a vote of 20% of the population. But this doesn't solve the problem we are discussing, democracy. The trouble is that, to me, it seems that democracy is a complicated form of government. Mm. If you think about it, it's the only form of government you have to learn if you grow up in a tribal society, you don't have to learn how it works. It comes from small child growing up, you know how it works. If you grow up in today's Russia under Putin, you know how it works. Certain things you're not going to do. Mm. In democracy, my kids ask me, what is this with a regional government, with a regional parliament? 
What do parliamentarians do? Who decides? Is Mrs. Merkel the king of Germany? Yeah? So democracy is a, it's a complicated mm. thing. And the, 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 the nice uh, uh, past we have was, uh, as I said before, that in the European Union it delivered. It delivered wealth and uh, it delivered uh, social progress and it delivered security. And now we see that democracy as a complicated system is put under strain. And since people have to learn it, they tend not to believe in it because it doesn't deliver. And that's the real challenge in, 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 in my perception, yeah? that we have to sell the virtues and uh, the positive sides of what democracy mm. delivers. Javi, Uwe just mentioned uh, output legitimacy as, you know, uh, what governments deliver is, you know, what basically makes people vote. But at the same time, you mentioned that, you know, fewer and fewer people go actually to vote yeah, and a government can be, a very sort of populist government can be elected on what, 20% of the actual voting public. So doesn't that lead to the point that input legitimacy, basically making democracy work as well uh, on the ground is also a much important point because, you know, the outcomes usually are a subject, a subject to the inputs in mm -hmm. that sense. So do we have to have a strategy bringing the two, t uh, the two together, actually? Mm. Sure, uh, sure. Um, my point is uh, we should change our method of decision, of taking decisions in Europe. This mm -hmm. is uh, one of the big discussions that we will have. Mm -hmm. uh, and we should have. Um, why? Because our method of taking decisions, and this was uh, one of the main points of the architecture of our democracy, always was the, was the same, it was method of unanimity and consensus. Yeah. Okay? And uh, this doesn't work now. Doesn't work if you uh, try to face a euro crisis with a huge imbalance of power between countries. Doesn't work uh, if you have to have a deal between everybody and one country. Yeah, it doesn't work if you need a uh, consensus, but some countries are blocking uh, some like uh, vital, like super important decisions that we have to make to to be efficient to face some problems, huge problems that we are facing, and this will be one of the more important uh, discussions the next years. Institutional changes, yes, uh, to to win new spaces of of mm. sovereignty of of democracy, or empowering the people, yes, but a key point is change or try to change, talk about the, the method of taking decisions mm -hmm. in Europe and try to complete our spaces because this is always the same. We, can, uh, we can't have like Schengen and, and then um, don't share our asylum uh, um, policy. Yeah. It's impossible. Um, or, for example, with the Eurozone, we, we can't have the same currency and at the same time don't have transference mm -hmm. or mm. euro bonds or this kind of redistribution yeah. methods or, or a strong budget. Like, we can't. Yeah. This is like, and this was a, a, a choice that we did. Uh, and then it's th time to apply. Uh, but apply, at the same time, we recognize that this is not only a thing of more integration, this is also a thing about better integration, uh, how to change our methods of taking decisions to have the feeling that we have power to change the future, mm -hmm. that this is something that the people is losing. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, uh, if we put a, um, in a view to the future, what are your key measures? What, do you, what would you like to see in order to strengthen European democracy and actually making the system more capable of actually addressing uh, the pressing issues? We talked about the multiple crises. What can we do to strengthen European democracy and integrate it much better with national level decision making so we can actually get a grip on these key issues? I think a key to that is um, the economic governance. How do we do that? How do we get parliamentary control about that? Mm -hmm. How do we also get indeed national parliaments involved? I think this is absolutely crucial. How do we get things out of the back room mm -hmm. uh, deals of the, um, of the Eurogroup, which is uh, super undemocratic. Uh, but then I think we also need to be lo forward looking. We actually need to um, ex well, explain. Well, we have need to have an answer to the question like, what does Europe bring for us? Uh, mm -hmm. That's not simply you know, data roaming. Um, and for that, I think the social Europe is absolutely crucial. Don't many people like that. Uh, <laughs> I like that too, but still, that's not, you know, that's not, not the enough. whole answer. It's not yeah. enough, exactly. Uh, so I think the social union will be absolutely crucial, but it's really difficult. Like, 
a lot of people will have to put a lot of brain work into how, figuring out how mm. this is going to work, how to improve the standards for everyone. I think this is absolutely uh, crucial and um, a bit apart from that, I mean, that's pretty much policy measures, but the other issue you've mentioned is about public sphere. Mm. How do we unite public debate? We see it in the refugee crisis being very different in different member states, also depending on what newspapers you read. Um, if you read any, but how do we bring that together? Also in the Euro crisis, that was so different or is still different because we're not all finished with that yet. So I think that is that is key to bringing people together. But for that, I think I'm, I'm optimistic in the sense that I think we can build on something. We mm. can build on the people who have been uh, appalled by how we dealt with the Euro crisis. We can, we can build on the people who have been helping refugees everywhere because that's many and they're everywhere and if we bring those people together then that is already creating something. I'm you know, rather optimistic that we're moving in, in the right direction. For example, if we look at a completely different topic, TTIP, uh, Transatlantic Trade Agreement, there we have a public debate all across Europe and yes it's stronger in some countries than in others but it's everywhere. I mean really going around a lot and also in Croatia and also in Hungary you have a debate on TTIP and that is I think I mean, you can think about what you want, but the debate around this, I think, is very unifying in that sense. Okay, yeah. Sophie, uh, you seem to be advocating a new, sort of new federalist construction. So what would that look like? Uh, you know, what, how would you construct a European federal system that strengthens European democracy? Yeah, well, yeah, in that respect, first of all, I think it's important to... Um, to recall that federalism um, is not, does not share sovereignty and does not abolish sovereignty traditionally. The EU has tried to, um, uh, to build a sort of very um, strange and hybrid federation because we are in between the intergovernmental and the supranational system. So this is not a traditional federation. If you look at the United States, if you look at Germany, uh, if you look at uh, Belgium, Switzerland, I mean, federal states do have a central sovereignty and do have a central representative democracy. Competencies are shared, but sovereignty, sovereign powers uh, in the main uh, field that, uh, that, 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 I mean, in the, in the main field such as the, the army, taxation, uh, macroeconomic policies, uh, control of borders, coercion, uh, security, all these fields, I mean, in, 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 in those fields there's only one sovereign power. And I think that's what we need ultimately at the European level. Obviously it's not going to happen uh, from one day to another and I think we'll probably have to go through a phase of disintegration before we have that, if we ever have it. But in what is really important to speak about when we speak about the um, Fed of, uh, European Federation is to make sure that, uh, first of all, we understand sovereignty and that we understand that it has to be uh, one and unique, but also that it has to be democratized. Because when we, sp we spoke earlier about input and output, and I think uh, if we look at the populist movement, uh, and then if we look at the sort of things we have at the European level, we have a discrepancy. I mean, the populist movements who are on the rise really uh, seem to equate input and output. They mm. seem to think that by having more democracy at the national level, in their case, they will have more policies they will deliver. Uh, and this association is ob obviously, um, I mean, not, not certain at all, um, particularly because we have so many matters that are already Europeanized. But if we look at the European level, we have a lot of output there, a lot of policies, a lot of policy making which is being done. Um, I mean, much more uh, is being advocated. I read uh, the five presidents' report, for instance. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a huge agenda, uh, which is not very much known by the public. Uh, the, 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 the fiscal union, mm -hmm. the financial union, the economic union, I disagree with a lot of it. But then you look at the institutional aspect, the political union, supposed to control or counterbalance the, this deeper European integration. It is, it's really nothing. So here you don't have an input, I mean, an input legitimacy, a sort of uh, demo, democratic process that would actually check and control this sort of deeper integration that we are already having and that we are, we are going to have more and more because it's the only way of dealing with the crisis yeah. that, that we are facing. So I think we need to really think about a long-term European federation in terms of input and output, so mm -hmm. delivering uh, mm -hmm. policies to, to the people that conform to the interests of the, of the citizens, but in a democratic way. Yeah. Uber, would you, would you agree with that? And actually, maybe you can also address in your sort of future-looking mm -hmm. remarks mm -hmm. also the question, where does sovereignty actually lie? Because that's not self-evident. Mm -hmm. If you look in most uh, constitutional setups, mm -hmm. it's the people that's the sovereign, mm -hmm. whereas many people, for instance, in the UK uh, say mm -hmm. that it's Parliament that is the sovereign. Mm -hmm. So therefore, mm -hmm. for instance, the Scottish Parliament is an act of the Westminster Parliament and could mm. feasibly be uh, repealed. That's mm. why also uh, people tend to give much more sort of preeminence mm. to decisions made in the Westminster Parliament mm. because Westminster all Parliament. the others seem to be sub, you know, 
second fiddle to Westminster because uh, it's seen that the institution has the mm. has sovereignty, mm. whereas elsewhere it's sovereign, mm. the sovereign is the people. So what, mm. what would your yeah, view I'm, be? In the first place, um, uh, linking to what you've said, I wouldn't look at it only from an institutional side, sovereignty. But I think we should look at it from uh, the question of nationhood. Because inside the European Union, we have younger and older nations. And we have very old democracies and very young democracies. So I think in, these, in this debate, we've got to be very careful. I would distinguish between nationalism and patriotism. Patriotism can be a necessary thing for national identity. So if you look at the Central and Eastern European countries, who are very young uh, democracies, they may need a space yeah, to find their place in globalization, in Europe, and in concerning the question of, of, of nationhood in a strange beast like the European Union, uh, which is not a nation state, neither a traditional multilateral organization. It's a sui generis uh, kind of thing. And I think when they joined the European Union, the Central and Eastern Europeans, um, they were not fully aware of what it meant. I mean, they wanted the good sides, as we, as we have said. But what we see now in Central and Eastern Europe, all over the place, not only Hungary and Poland, is that it is not only an economic question which brings people up to vote, uh, let's say, anti-democratic. It's a cultural thing. It's a religious thing. You have a reactionary Roman Catholic Church in uh, Poland, which is really uh, supporting the discrimination of gays and other minorities. Yeah? So this is not only uh, uh, um, an institutional question, mm -hmm. but it goes far beyond that. And I think the virtue of the European Union has always been that it, has ta that it was slow. Mm -hmm. Slowness as a virtue. In crisis, this may cause trouble, mm -hmm. because you've got to be quick. But democracy and the European Union are slow systems. And sometimes slow is good. If you look at, uh, for example, the, the, the Ukraine crisis, and you imagine the management of the Ukraine crisis without the European Union existing, what would the Russians have done? Negotiated with the Brits, with the French, with the Germans, maybe with the Poles, I have my doubts about this. And then we would have had a split reaction. And we would have had a martial reaction yeah, of people like Schröder or Cameron or so. Wouldn't have been good. It was good that it was a mm -hmm. European mm -hmm. Union in place, a slow system. You had to sleep about it. You had to discuss about it. It was not a male-dominated uh, testosterone decision, I'm against Putin. Yeah? So sometimes slowness is good. And this is all involved in the process we're discussing. European democracy. Mm -hmm. So I think what we need is time, but we don't have time. And that's a little bit, that's the, the, that's that's, the, that's the big problem. Yeah. Javi, the last word is yours. The Europe, European democracy is a glacier. It's moving very slowly and it might be melting away. <laughs> what, can, what can we do to, to actually turn this around? Try to have a, a mix, a policy mix of, of efficient, of uh, values, of institutional change, to have a better democratic process. This is the answers. Mm -hmm. uh, values of solidarity, uh, to try to face all the crises that we are facing, mm -hmm. all of them, by the refugee crisis, Eurozone, and the unity of Europe. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid this is all we have time for today. Thank you all very much for participating in this discussion about European democracy, and I hope you'll join us next time again. Thank you very much. Thank you.